well. Good. Those of you who have your Bibles, if we turn to Romans 10, please, we'll start there. And I want to share some stuff that's very heartfelt in my own case. Uh, I want to share a verse that I heard when I was a brand new Christian, and it's blessed me ever since. And first of all, I'll read the verse, then we'll read the context. So we're in Romans chapter 10. It's obviously Paul writing to people in Rome. And I'm going to read from verse... Where are we? From verse 12... For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord is Lord of all, abounding in riches for all who call on him. Now what went off in my head as a brand new Christian is this amazing promise, abounding in riches for all who call. And there's some key words in there that I want to go into tonight, but now I'll read the context. So that's the verse we're going to settle on. But just before we get there earlier, from verse 5, Romans 10 again. Moses writes that the, king, that the man who practices righteousness, which is based on law, shall live by that righteousness. For the righteousness based on faith speaks as follows. Do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down, or who will descend into hell or the abyss, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we are preaching, that if you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart a, man, a person believes, resulting in righteousness, and with the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. For the scripture says, whoever believes in him will not be disappointed. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord is Lord of all, abounding in riches for all who call on him. So now I want to go through that passage uh, because it relates very closely to a prayer answering God and there are some key words in there. We don't have to always identify the words, but it's helpful sometimes just to see how rich it is and how wonderful it is. So uh, that's what we'll do then. First of all, verse 6, the righteousness based on faith speaks as follows. Now, here's something interesting about faith. It speaks. It speaks. Faith speaks. And uh, earlier this morning, your pastor uh, mentioned a scripture from Psalms, Let the righteous say so, whom he has redeemed from the hand of the fowler. And I made a decision to be a say-so Christian. So I will tell strangers answers to prayer, or I'll tell them things God did because I know that a light shines in the darkness very brightly if they're in walking in darkness, if they're confused and they hear just one piece of truth, the Holy Spirit might ignite it to them. He might not to, but you have a go. You just try. Something Mario Murillo said that I really liked, Pastor Mar Mario Murillo, he said, if you strike a match in a coal mine, it'll blind your eyes if you're in deep darkness. But if you strike the same match at midday with the sun overhead, nobody's impressed. Because the darkness makes the light shine very bright. And sometimes when we're ministering to people or talking to people or witnessing to relatives, friends, children, we think we haven't said much. But we don't know what deep darkness they're in. And we don't realize how brightly that light shines. And we overload them. We give them too much truth, too many verses, and they all get lost because... It's too much. You overfeed people. They cough it all up. But you just do a simple truth 
walk away and believe the word of God does its work. It's got amazing power. In the book of Job it says, though the tree be cut off at the stump and its roots wither and dry in the soil, yet at the scent of water it shall sprout again. Sometimes it takes a very little word of encouragement to light up somebody's world and yours. Sometimes you're reading scripture and you're trying to do a big Bible study hoping that it's going to light up your spirit and just one word speaks to you. Half a sentence. And I believe the word of God's got enormous power to restore your soul. And we need soul restoration. A lot of people have been beaten up by life. Faith speaks. That was verse 6. The righteousness based on faith speaks. It's righteousness speaking, but it's speaking by faith. Do not say in your heart, who will ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down, or who will descend into the abyss, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. The idea that God is remote will trip you up. If you think he's in the high heaven and not very interested in you, you try and bring him down. Even fasting is dangerous if you start thinking you're paying for blessings. That, that's not the purpose of fasting. David says, I humbled my soul with fasting. So he, it dealt with his pride. It got him out of the way. It removed the blockage in his heart. And I believe in fasting. Jesus said that uh, his servants will fast until he comes. And so it's very scriptural to fast. As long as you don't think that you've twisted God's arm behind your back and three days is better than one and he owes you. And it's easy to get into. There are times when I have prayed, when I really have said to the Lord, look, I've been counseling a lot of people lately and I've been doing a lot of things for you. Uh, so I'm more liable to get an answer to prayer now than when I stuff up and watch something on TV that I'm ashamed of. But that's a religion of works again. That's getting back, that's throwing grace away. That's forgetting that it's by his righteousness we live, not by our own and you can get very religious. I did a big backslide when I was in Amsterdam. I lost my faith and I felt I could never believe again or pray again or believe that there would be an answer from God again. I really believed God had disappointed me, even though this chapter says those who trust in the Lord will not be disappointed. But I felt disappointed. And I went to another country where there was an old man of God who knew me very well and he said, I expected it to happen to you. I said, did you? He said, yes. I said, but it was God that stuffed up. It wasn't me. It was God. And I, I, I told him what I had prayed. I said, Lord, I can't trust you because you promised I wouldn't be disappointed, and I am. And you, you were absent when I needed you, and you were nowhere near. And even if you repent and become faithful, uh, I will always remember the time you let me down. And I believed it. I believed that God had failed. And I would see Malachi um, 3, 6, you know, I am the Lord, I change not. And I thought, well, it's all very well to say it, but you did change. And how can I forgive you? I can't forgive God. And my friend said, can you not hear how religious and self-righteous you've become? You can bring God to the judgment bar and find him guilty. He said, I saw it happening. He said, you were like an archer with the bow and arrow, and you never relaxed the string. You just got tighter and tighter, believing you were serving a disappointed God. And that attitude is what made you religious and made you lose sight of grace. And so when you backslid, that was expected, because you got too religious. I said, but I lost my faith. He said, no, you didn't. You lost your religion, good riddance to bad rubbish. <laughs> and there's grace in that. There's grace in that. Somebody came after me during that time to restore me, and they said, in the story of the prodigal son that goes home, who is the heavenly father in the story? I said, well, the heavenly father's God, of course. He said, well, how much does God know? I go, oh, oh everything. I, you know, if it was a question and answer thing or a quiz that you get money for, you try to get the right answers. I said, well, it'll be God. He said, well, did he know the boy was coming home? He said, oh, yes. Did he know that he would repent? Yes. What does the Bible say he did? He ran to meet him. 
And he said, you think that you'll just take your time and repent when you like, but your heavenly father is running towards you even now because he's going to receive you home with utter forgiveness. And I wept and wept for such love. I got the revelation of it and I came home and I'm still here and I still believe. But I went through a time when I really thought I could never laugh again, never believe again. People around me had died that I loved. I'd been through some rough times. I now don't think God is remote. But thinking he's so far up in heaven that you've got to be particularly holy or he won't listen or that you've got to shout to cover the distance. There was a lady who lived upstairs from me who used to call home in Canada and uh, she'd shout on the phone as if it somehow helped the message get to Canada. And uh, Christians do that. They shout and yell at God because it makes them seem very spiritual. I, I watched a little girl with a plastic telephone having a big conversation, nobody talking back, and I thought that's how prayer often feels. But there's a real prayer answering God, rich unto all that call upon him. And then it says... But what does it say? The word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we are preaching. That if you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. In New Zealand there was a Professor Gearing. He was a Presbyterian professor, educated way beyond his intellect. And he made the statement that Jesus never physically rose from the dead and I said to him well then I cannot receive you as a Christian because Romans 10 says you must believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is Lord and that God raised him from the dead that's the minimum and you must be able to confess it and if you can't meet the criteria you're not a Christian you're not born again those who are born again can confess the resurrection and they can confess Jesus as Lord he said well if I believed the Bible meant what you say it means, then I would agree. But he couldn't. We bend the scripture to suit our lifestyle instead of adjusting our lifestyle to suit scripture. And then it says, you will be saved. The word sozo in Greek means to repair something that was broken or to replace it with something completely whole. And that's a very good word. This is the word we translate saved. And it says, with the lips, confession is made unto salvation. So here's something. You can minister repair to yourself by how you talk. Because it's the word for repair, sozo. It's the word from which we get the word salvation in Latin, salvus. In fact, there's a plant called salvia, which has got a bright red flower, symbol of the blood. And the Romans used every part of it like they do verbena, the same. We use the roots, you use the leaves, you use the flowers in medicine. Every part of it can be used for medicine and for healing. And so they're called the whole plant salvia. And you, you grow it here in Mariba. You see it in people's gardens sometimes with bright scarlet flower. Um, and Jesus' own name, of course, has this in it. The J-E is short for Jehovah, or the Father God, and Sus is soterio again, it's sozo again, it's that different forms of the same word. That means to heal or to be whole. You shall call his name Jesus because he shall save his people from their sins. So even the name of Jesus itself is saying God is the healer, the restorer, our salvation. Not just our converter, it's not just a free pass into heaven, you've got that as well. But you've got complete pardon in his name. And confession is made unto salvation. Instead of just begging God to heal you, you can heal yourself by claiming his promises and by saying he is faithful. Here's another interesting thing. The word faith, I mentioned it this morning, pista, uh, means that you are relying on a faithful character or testimony. It's a word that comes from the law courts when somebody who is a credible witness says something and it's established as being the truth, that you go, okay, this person is a reliable witness. They were there at the time. They did see what they saw. 
we know they were, we can place them in the... If you show up to a court and say, I want to be a witness, but I wasn't there and I didn't see anything, you'd go, well, then you're not a credible witness. But if you saw everything and you confess it, that's a different thing. Now you've got a faithful testimony, and Jesus Christ is the faithful witness. And when the Apostle Paul meets Jesus on the road in Acts 26, he says, I'm going to make you a minister and a witness to the things you have seen. And every believer sees answers to prayer and promises come true and gifts from the Lord. And then we tell people that is what, that's tied to the word pistis. Because it's a faithful testimony you're relying on. You're, tr you're trusting God's word because it's the truth. You're trusting God because he is the truth. You're trusting Jesus because he is the truth. That's the word faith. It's often translated belief. Sometimes you'll hear a sermon saying your belief can turn into faith. That's nonsense. That's like saying a butterfly can turn into a butterfly because it's the same word in both cases. The word belief, the word faith, they're the same. But it's God-given belief. It's not just belief in fairies or some nonsense. It's a faithful witness from heaven that speaks in your heart and you trust the witness and his message. That's faith. And if faith's a gift from God, that means you get divine help from God to believe his promises. It means he imparts it. It's not from you. It's a gift. The word says it. And once you know that, it takes the struggle out of faith because you just go, if God said it, I believe it, that settles it. But if you intellectualize it, you come up with it. I asked Mel Tari, why is it that you had such a revival in Indonesia, so many miracles, and we don't see the same in Australia? He said, because the Christians have got too many excuses for why God doesn't work. You talk yourselves out of it. I remember... a. Uh, I used to minister quite a lot amongst Anglican churches. And there was a Samoan lady who said to the bishop, who was my friend, is Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever? She'd read Romans 12. And he said, well, not exactly, because on earth he did miracles and there were healings, but they've stopped. The word is now confirmed, and so there's no need for more. She said, well, then why did my daughter just get healed when I prayed? And later, the bishop got baptized in the Holy Spirit and spoke in other tongues, got released in the gifts. He came through it to a whole new level of faith. But I'm not talking about faith to be converted. He was converted. But faith to be saved and healed in a whole lot of other areas. I had a friend, his name was Maynard Rutherford. He was in the Methodist church. He was a liberal theologian. He understood Greek. He understood Hebrew. But he was full of unbelief. He believed God didn't mean what he said. He believed that we had just an elaborate imaginary friend and that Christianity was for ethics, not for relationship with a living God who really speaks to our own heart. But something went wrong. He got baptized in the Holy Spirit. He looked at the same scriptures with new eyes and he said, now I can see they're true. So he told the Methodist church, he said, the stuff I've been teaching has been rubbish. I, I haven't been honest to the Greek or the Hebrew. I've read my unbelief into scripture and now that I'm baptized in the Holy Spirit, I can see it's all true. Well, they put him in Maharangi Union Parish in the north of Auckland, which was a dead little church where they thought he could do no harm. Big mistake because God can do wonderful things out of little things, out of, out of little acorns, big oaks grow. So they put him in this church. He went to the farmers, and he said to the farmers, when's carving season, when's your harvests? We'll change the church times to suit so we don't conflict with the rhythms of the farm. And they loved that. He was so practical. He arranged working bees for men to help each other on their farms. He got them baptized in the Holy Spirit, delivered of demons and supporting missions. And the church grew to hundreds and hundreds. People began flocking to the church from all over the country because they wanted to see God. They wanted to see him at work. They wanted to see signs that he's a prayer answering God. He only died just a few months ago as a very old man 
But for years and years, people traveled miles to see him because they knew he was a believing man who had a God he could receive from. See, people with a real experience from God are not at the mercy of intellectuals who have excuses of why it doesn't work. It does work. And if you've experienced God, you can witness to it and you can say it. Now, the other statement here, verse 12, for there is no distinction between the Jew and the Greek, for the same Lord is Lord of all, abounding in riches for all who call upon him. I just want to go into that. There is no distinction, that's the word for difference, and I believe in distinctions. I'm not anti-intellectual, but one of the things being taught in universities and in social services and so on is the idea that everything's got to be non-binary, not male and female, not black and white, and so on. But if you read your Bible, you'll see that God is very definite, male and female created he them, and he also talks about sin and righteousness, definite binaries. He talks about light and darkness. He talks about discernment. Discernment admits that things belong in different categories. Sin is not righteousness. There's no overlap. In fact, uh, in John, it says, first John, it says, God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. God hates mixture. And holiness means there's no mixture, pure. The river of life that comes out from the throne of God and of the Lamb in, uh, in uh, Revelations 22 is as clear as crystal. It's unmuddied, it's unmixed. And uh, so get rid of the mixture and you end up with something definite. And it says there's no distinction between Jew and Greek. So here's something interesting. If God says that he's unified Jew and Greek, both of them thought they were superior to the other, then we can be together in the church with no difference. Sometimes people treat me very special because of my Jewish roots, but not God. Not God. God taught me the precious blood is the blood of Jesus, not mine or my ancestors. There is a false teaching in Christian churches at the moment that you'll understand your Bible better if you study Jewish authors. It's a load of rubbish. It's not true. What the Bible does say it says, when Moses is read, not Jesus, when Moses is read, a veil is over their face, but when a man turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. In other words, you believe in the Lord Jesus, you will understand your Bible. And if you're Jewish and you're listening to Moses, a veil is over your face. You don't understand what you're hearing. I've had friends who were rabbis, they were clever people, but until they come to the Lord, they, they don't understand. One man, he was in his 80s when he got saved, he was hitchhiking. And he was picked up by a man called Milton Smith, who was a brethren evangelist. And he said to the brethren evangelist, if I wanted to be a Christian, what would I do? And he said, you would invite the Lord Jesus into your heart. And he told him how, and he led him in this in his prayer, and my friend got saved. Now, the Bible says, whoever loves the Father loves the Son, born of him, that rabbi had no big arguments against Christianity because he did love God, he just didn't know him. But Jesus said, I'm the way to the Father. Nobody comes unto the Father except by me. And no one knows the Father except the Son reveals him. The rabbi got an understanding of who God is because he accepted Jesus with all his heart. So don't go to unsaved Jews to try and understand your Bible. I'm not anti-Jewish, I am a Jew. But I'm saying you'll understand your Bible by turning to Jesus with your whole heart himself. He's your teacher. He's the truth. So it says there's no difference between Jew or Greek. For the same Lord is Lord of all. The word Lord is kurios. It's an interesting word. It's like the Hebrew word Adonai. It means the legitimate owner. You can never say to God, who do you think you are? Because he owns everything. Owns the world, owns you. You're not your own, you're bought with a price. There isn't anything on this globe. God's not an intruder. He's not a usurper. He owns everything. It's all his. Kyrios. And the, the Greeks had a word for it, meaning lordship, but it's not equivalent to saying emperor. 
it's something different. It's that God is the correct possessor of all things. In fact, there's a similar word in Hebrew, shiloh, and it means he whose right it is, that when the Messiah comes, whatever he claims is his. I was talking to a rabbi in uh, Philadelphia who was part of the liberal synagogue there, and he said, oh, I don't support Jews for Jesus, and uh, I do, but he didn't. And I said, why not? He said, because they're too Jewish. And I said, but surely you should be pleased. And he goes, no, because when the Messiah comes, uh, I can't keep anything he doesn't agree with. If Jesus really would be the Messiah, he's got the right to get rid of anything in my life that he doesn't agree with, because Moses said, whoever will not walk according to the words of that prophet shall be struck off from amongst the people. So he said, if he's the Messiah... I only keep what he legitimizes, and I get rid of everything that he tells me to get rid of. I said, you're telling me the Holy Spirit's been teaching you because that's exactly what Jesus said. Unless a man deny himself and take up his cross, he cannot be my disciple. You have to give up everything, and you're willing. Amazing. Curious. If Jesus is Lord, everything changes. Can you hear where I'm going? If Jesus is Lord, and it says he is Lord, and then in verse 12, for the same Lord is Lord of all, abounding in riches. Well, of course he is, if he owns everything, then he's abounding in riches. For all who call on him. How many does all leave out? So that means that if you call on the Lord, he'll be rich unto everyone, and abounding is an interesting word. It, uh, I don't always go into words, but the word abundance is a big one for me because there's a doctrine of prosperity and abundance. And I ask the Lord, is it true? I was going through a hard time. I was short of cash, but I was short of other answers to prayer. And I was saying to the Lord, I don't want to teach that you're a God of prosperity or abundance if you're not. So will you tell me? Who are you? Because some Christians think you are. Some think it's better to be poor. Everyone's got an opinion on it. What's yours about yourself? And I was in a second-hand shop, and there was a little Japanese text written in kanji script, which I can't read. And I took it to Japan Airlines. The Lord said, buy it, so I bought it. It was $2.50 or something. And uh, it was just a little plaque. And I took it into Japan Airlines and showed it to them. And they said, oh, this is from a Chinese word, feng fu. And it means abundance. I said, in what sense does it mean abundance? Because I hadn't, I hadn't primed the witness. I hadn't used the word abundance near them. They came up with it. I said, what does it mean? And they said, well, it's not in the sense of a reservoir that you fill and then the jug is full or the reservoir is full. It's more in the sense of a spring that never stops or a river that never runs dry. So I'm looking at this Fong Fu symbol after I'd asked God, are you a God of abundance? <laughs> then I began exploring Greek and Hebrew, the word abundance, and I found out it means the same thing. It means, in fact, during Passover, when you fill the cup of blessing with wine, you deliberately overflow it into the saucer to show that God's blessings are more than enough, not just enough. And, of course, that's exactly what David says in Psalm 23, my cup overflows. Overflowing cup, not half full, not half empty, overflowing. And that's that word abundance. I stayed at somebody's house where the bath was upstairs and I turned the bath on and it filled so slowly, I went downstairs to watch TV. And there I learned about abundance when water came through the light fitting and poured down through the ceiling. That overflowing bath taught me what abundance is. It means more than enough. It means overflow. We had dehumidifiers on and, think, and trying to dry out the house before the people came home. I was in big trouble. But they had, it had gone all through the linen cabinet everywhere. But uh, they were very gracious to me, and they were insured. They got a new carpet out of it, but I never forgot it. 
Now, let's see where we've gone. I've said God's faithful when he makes a promise. His character is spotless. His word is reliable. I said the word faith is from the law courts, and it means a reliable witness whose testimony can be trusted. I said faith is a gift, not something you have to come up with. It's something God gives you. You can read about that if you want to in Romans 15, where it says it very, very plainly. It says God imparts faith by the power of the Holy Spirit so that you are overflowing with hope. Uh, Marvellous. Romans 15, verse 13. Uh, Ephesians 2.10, you're saved by faith, that not of yourself, it is the gift of God. The ability to believe that God means what he says comes from heaven, you can ask for it and you can receive it as a free gift. Just like that. Then I said, God believes in distinctions of light and dark, right and wrong, truth and error. And so as he leads you into the truth of the scripture, you can rely on the differences that he teaches you. And he says, concerning Jews and Greeks, neither side's got a superiority because God says now there's no difference. I said it's dangerous to put Jews on a pedestal saying they're superior Bible teachers. That is just superstitious rubbish because the Bible teaches the opposite. We can trust God's word. Anyone skilled in God's word, Jew, Gentile, Chinese, anyone. uh, It's the word that is wise. It's not us. And it's certainly nothing to do with our race. The Bible also says neither male nor female, bond or free. It doesn't mean you lose your identity. I don't stop being Jewish because I'm saved. It just means I haven't got any superior ground to you. And you haven't got any superior ground to me. We're all equal in the sight of God. We're all one because the cross has removed all the differences. He says there's neither Jew nor Greek and he says the same Lord, your Lord and my Lord, is rich unto all who call upon him. When I first started the Jesus Centre, we needed curtains. I couldn't afford them. I read where Jesus said, your heavenly Father knows what things you have need of before you ask. So I said, Lord, you know I need a fire screen because we still had coal fires in those days. I said, Lord, I'd like a brass fire screen. I'd like an aquarium. I'd like purple curtains, reddish purple curtains, maroon curtains. And I made a long list, and I wrote them all in the back of my diary. And I knew you have not because you ask not. The same Lord is rich unto all that call upon him. And I said, Lord, I'm willing to receive nothing on the list or all of it. You choose. At the end of the year, I had a date next to each item, and I had received them all. Uh, I got given brass candlesticks and the brass fire screen. Don't give it to me now. My tastes have changed. But but that's what happened. God gave it. I had the aquarium. I had the curtains. I had all the things on my list. Because it says God is rich unto those that call upon him. We often think God's only willing to give us his scraps, but he's a God of abundance. Think of the overflowing cup, the overflowing bath. And the same, when we approach God for the Holy Spirit and we want to be baptized in the Holy Spirit, we think we've got to be very holy and very full of faith, otherwise he won't listen. But Jesus said, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask? Just ask. Ask a God who wants to richly bless Sometimes when I have given to somebody or they've given to me, God teaches one of us to give more generously than we had intended and says, top it up because I'm the God of the overflow. So I'll give you an example. My friend Jeff Woodward over in Perth, who I love, is very generous. And he loves colognes and he buys colognes and they're $60, $70 a bottle. But he tires of them quickly and so I get them. So I have bottles and bottles of cologne that I never bought. I got them all from Jeff because he sends his half-filled bottles or when I'm over there he gives me his half-filled bottles of things. But God convicted him. So he bought me a new bottle that had been untouched and unopened because God was teaching him the high road instead of sending me his leftovers. Uh, There was nothing wrong with him giving at the level he gave. But he got this revelation that God is a God of abundance. 
And that's why I told you about the slogan on the, the Fung Fu symbol, because when I talk to Chinese friends who know it very well, uh, there's, there's lots of reasons why it's good. But when it talks about you've got abundant grace, overflowing grace, abundant pardon, he shall abundantly pardon, abundant forgiveness, abundant supply, out of his abundance have we all received. Remember, it's not just enough. It's more than enough. Now, that God, like I said, has got no favorites. God is not a respecter of persons. I don't have a hotline to God that you don't have. And I don't have a superior standing with God that you don't have. God is as willing to be rich unto you when you call as I am. One of the reasons we don't receive by prayer is we're too casual about it. We just throw a prayer up and no heart in it. We don't expect to receive. But it's when you expect to receive, and David says, my expectation is from him. God can teach you how to receive, and he can teach you how to call. Can you hear me on that? One last illustration. There was a lady who came around to my house. Her little tiny tot had run away and was somewhere on the streets. And we were praying for her to come home and all be found and be safe. I prayed for a few minutes and I was finished. Because it wasn't my little girl. I had no connection with her. I only had a connection with the mother who wanted to pray. But the mother couldn't stop calling on God. Because her heart was involved in an entire... The little girl was found. She was completely all right. Uh, she was just a bold little girl who had no fear of anything. And that was the danger. But she was completely safe. But I think back on it and I think, I want to call on God like that mother called on God for her little girl and you know blessed are they that hunger and thirst after righteousness for they shall be filled and God knows how to stir you up and get you praying very earnestly and get you calling this and I'll close with this the same Lord is Lord of all rich unto all that call upon him rich unto all that call in the Song of Solomon's, when the bridegroom is talking to the bride, he says this, You who dwell in the gardens with your friends, let me hear your voice. That's what God says to you. He says, call to me. Call to me. Let me be rich to you. Call to me. Ask me everything. Ask whatever your heart desires. Call. I'll teach you how to call, and I'll teach you how to receive and I'll give things to you, and you'll have a testimony, and you'll tell people. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. God bless you.